Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you wherever you are in the world. Welcome to LBMA webinars, our final one before the summer. Today we're looking at hot topics, silver, central banks, and Basel III, or Basel III. Um, and uh, with us today we have Adrian Ash, he's the Director of Research at Bullion Vaults. Uh, we also have Krishan Gopal, uh, Senior Analyst, BMEA at the World Girl Council. We have Philip Newman, Managing Director at Metals Focus. And finally, we have David Gornall, Senior Advisor at LBMA. BMA. Before I do hand over to the panelists, I'm just going to take you through a housekeeping slide. If you do have any questions throughout the webinar, uh, please use the Q&A function uh, either at the bottom of your screen or the top, depending on the version that you have. If you're struggling to find this or you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, just email ask at lbma.org.uk and someone will forward those questions over to us. Um, this also applies if you're watching the recorded version. We'll make sure those questions get to the panellists. Uh, so without further ado, Adrian. Thank you, Taylor. Um, well, hello, everybody, friends, colleagues, competitors, customers around the world. Uh, thanks very much for joining us for this final uh, pre-summer LBMA webinar today. Um, the first half of 2022 has been very busy for our market, of course, and not only in terms of prices, but gold was the best performing major asset class, excluding energy uh, between Jan and June. Uh, but that was a pretty low bar given the carnage that the US dollar has caused, surging to two decade highs on its dollar index. Silver, meantime, is down alongside industrial metals as recession fears bite. And of course, as ever, rules and regulations continue to accumulate an impact, how particularly banks are trading in our markets. So there's lots and lots of hot topics uh, to look at and to pick from beneath the hood here. Three major issues we're going to look at today are Basel regulations and how they continue to come in and impact what's happening in our markets, silver supply and demand, um, and also central bank action in gold. So couldn't ask for a more expert panel than uh, the people that we managed to gather together today for you. So let's get into it with Krishan Gopal, Senior Analyst at World Gold Council first. Hey, Krish. Um, obviously, Krish, you're a specialist in central bank activity. Why are central banks relevant to the gold market? Well, of course, they hold, what, about a fifth of all the gold ever mined in history? Um, Hi there, Adrian. Yeah, yes, yes. So as you rightly point out, central banks are uh, significant holders of uh, gold around, I think, 35, 36,000 tonnes, uh, which is around a fifth of the above ground stock. Um, and typically, it's a huge area of interest in the gold market because they're such active uh, participants. Um, and, and we'll go into some of the details today, but it is always a, a topic we face a lot of questions on um, and, and always, um, always a lot of interest over. Fantastic. OK, so if you want to go to your first slide then, Krish, and so looking back, I now I believe this shows us the first quarter. Obviously, you guys are going to be collating your Q2 data right now, but this shows us the numbers up to the end of March, right? Yeah, that's correct. So I, I thought the, the first slide will, will be a bit of a, a scene setter. Um, and then what we want to do is discuss, well, you know, we've already talked about central banks being uh, hugely active. So what have uh, what has led led to that that kind of conclusion? Well, since about 2010, so the last decade, central banks switched from net purchases on an annual basis to, to net buyers. And we've really seen that trend in place for that 10 years. And, and here on a quarterly basis, um, you can see, at least from 2014, that, again, they have been consistent buyers, net buyers, um, on a quarterly basis, uh, one blip in 2020. Now, obviously, 2020 was a special case. We had the pandemic, uh, and that really hit central bank demand like it did hit demand for, for gold uh, across the market. Um, but we saw that really rebound um, from about 255 tonnes in 2020 to about 456 tonnes last year. Um, and so we saw that resumption in strength and that resumption in um, uh, the kind of central bank interest in gold. And we've really seen that continue into the first half of 2022. As you rightly say, for the time being, we only have data, uh, published data to uh, the end of uh, Q1, um, but we will be coming out at the end of January with our, our full year, uh, full uh, Q2 numbers and H1. So this gives you a sense that actually central banks are, are huge, huge buyers of gold, um, and, and they're really, really invested in that. Um, and the strength that we saw in 2021, following a slightly weaker 2022, has continued so far into 2020, uh, sorry, into 2021, has continued into 2022. 
just in terms of context, I mean, if you look at those big spikes back in 2018, 2019, 2018, if I recall, that was like a five decade record for central bank demand, right? Yeah, that's right. That was a significant amount of interest we saw in those years. Um, and it wasn't necessarily um, out of context. It certainly was something that, you know, we'd, we'd can see in this continued demand. But I think the levels of demand that we saw in those two years, you know, were particularly notable. Now that came off slightly um, uh, thereafter, and, and then weakened in 2020. But again, you know, while that was a high, we've continued to see very, very significant levels of demand since, even if they ever haven't reached those those kind of higher levels that we saw. So Q122 would be historically a high level. I mean, obviously, if we're looking at this chart, it's it's towards the lower end of the range. But historically, that would be, you know, if we look back a decade, that would be, you know, considered a very strong quarter, right? Yeah, I mean, Q2 was was in and of itself still very healthy, uh, uh, around 84 tonnes. So certainly, um, you know, not not uh, not weak by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and I think, again, you know, we're, we're still finding our way out of the impact of the pandemic. Um, you know, the 84 tonnes uh, against the backdrop of incredible amount of economic and geopolitical uncertainty. So I think while we have seen central bank demand ebb and flow ever so slightly um, in the last, say, 18 months, mm -hmm. um, it's certainly still very much on the net purchasing side. And, you know, if we move to the next slide, we can move the picture along into to the first half of the year. And we really can break down that buying that we've seen. Now, this data uh, on the chart is actually till the end of May. So it extends beyond that Q1 um, that we saw in, in the first chart. Um, and this gives you a sense of, of the, 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 the breadth of buying that we're seeing. So again, a large number both on the buying side, and we don't want to neglect that there have been um, reductions in central bank reserves across the, uh, across the world. Um, so certainly it's, it's no means a one-way picture, but it's, um, it certainly shows you the level of demand. Now, I think, you know, it's key to pick out a few points on this chart. Firstly, much as we've seen since central banks became net buyers on an annual basis, in a decade ago, the vast majority of the buying that we've seen is on the emerging market side. Um, really in this chart, the one standout is Ireland in terms of, of, of breaking that trend. Uh, they, they have been a consistent buyer um, for um, the last six months or so to the end of Q1. Um, and they increased their, their gold reserves, you know, in absolute terms, it was relatively small, but percentage terms, it was nearly doubling. Uh, and, and they were the first, um, uh, along with Singapore last year, uh, um, advanced market banks who have, uh, who actually increased their gold reserves for quite some time, I think, since Korea in around 2014. So that was notable. Um, however, uh, you know, Ireland in particular, they're, they're buying, uh, hasn't continued into Q2. So it's uncertain to really Really, to kind of really point towards that as any sort of emerging trend, but certainly something that we're looking into uh, and, and whether they could potentially lead to any more interest on, on the developed market side. Um, but as the chart highlights, you know, the, the vast majority of the buying has been, you know, amongst a small number of central banks dominated by, by Turkey, Egypt and Iraq, most notably uh, in, in June. Um, they have all been significant buyers. Um, on the selling side, um, it's interesting to point out uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan as the two largest uh, sellers. Um, now, they're both gold producing nations, so it's not um, uncommon to see them uh, both buy and sell gold. Um, and in fact, a lot of the buy uh, selling, sorry, that we saw from both Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan occurred in Q1 when we saw the price at a much higher level. Um, we, got as, we got to $2,000 again, right? That's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in around February time, um, uh, again, uh, around the, the, the kind of the peak of the geopolitical crisis in, in Ukraine and, and just general economic uncertainty that has carry over from last year. Um, and but as we've moved through Q2 and the price, the gold price has come off those highs, we've actually seen the switch to net purchasing again. So there could be an element of a, a, a kind of a, a tactical uh, playing with their, their gold reserves. But again, I think that's also uh, important to mention that they, they are significant gold producers. Um, and so that might have a bearing on how they manage those gold reserves. Um, it's also Talking of significant producers, obviously, Russia, the world mm -hmm. number two gold miner now behind China. Um, you've got an asterisk on that. 
what um, what do we know about what's happening with Russia with the CBR uh, and their gold activity now? Yeah, I mean that that has been probably one of the eminent top topics for for the first half of 2022. Um, so so certainly we have data up until the end of January, and, and that's what the the asterisks is, uh, signify on the chart is that the the, the last available data point is to the end of January, and that indicated that gold reserves had had. Um, been reduced incrementally by about three tons. However, at the end of February, um, announcement was made by the, the Central Bank of Russia that they would look to resume their purchases that they had suspended um, since March 2020. Um, however, we have not received any data updates on what their level of gold reserves are. So yeah. we want to indicate that while that, that the chart is showing a, a three ton decline, that may not be representative of what the activity the, the Russian Central Bank has been seeing in respect to their gold reserves. And we're also seeing news more recently that the, um, they are looking to, to pass through a law to make the publication of the level of their gold reserves a state secret. So at the oh, moment, okay. yeah, so at the moment, we're quite unsure when, if and when we might see any updates to the Russian data. Um, we put Russia down on the chart because it reflects the most available data that we have. Um, but certainly, um, it, it's, it's interesting to note that, that, that this may not be representative of the level of, of activity that, that the Russian central bank is, is doing in respect to gold. And just for context, before we move on to your next slide, obviously, Russia has been the largest central bank gold buyer so far in the 21st century. I mean, I, I think it's probably up there if it's not the number one. Uh, and of course, Russia during the Western sanctions against Russia over the uh, invasion of Crimea back in 2014, the CBR did then step in and buy, I mean, I think I made it out to be about 80% of Russia's gold mine output over the following four years actually ended up at the CBR. So it, it's clearly a big question about, you know, where does Russian gold go now that it's sanctioned and effectively blocked from Western markets, new mine output. You know, will it find its way eastwards, perhaps, or will the central bank step in? So I think that's a that's a that's a, a really interesting question at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're you're right to point out that Russia was a significant purchaser. I think from around 2014, 2015, maybe. Um, don't quote me on my dates. Um, but certainly they were a, a significant purchaser um, globally, not just just within the country. And they and a lot of their gold came primarily from domestic production. Um, it's potentially the case that they that, that they have res resumed that 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 buying of domestic production given the sanctions in place. However, as I said, just th there is a, a, a kind of a real dearth of, of information and, and, and kind of data out there that kind of helps support that. Uh, a lot of it is supposition at the moment. Um, however, I think, you know, it's reasonable to think that um, potentially Russian reserves might be higher than, than, than we're seeing. But again, there's no data to support that either, either way. Right. Data you do have on your next slide, I know, is actually motivations for central banks um, in terms of you know, why they're holding gold. So do you want to talk us through, this is a survey which the World Gold Council runs, is it annual? Yeah, that's right. This is our, our central bank survey, and, and this is the, the fifth year that we've done it. Um, and we get a tremendous response from central banks. Um, and it really, the purpose of it is really to, to kind of give us a sense of what um, uh, central banks are kind of sentiment and view is towards gold and 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 also what their atten intentions are and i'll come to that on my next slide but on this slide um this helps again provide some additional color and insight into the reasons and motivations why central banks hold gold so you can see here there are a number of different uh, different reasons uh, factors given um and central banks have indicated by agreeing how relevant these particular factors are in their decision in owning gold. So really, you know, how they see gold and the role that it could play within an international reserve portfolio. Now you can see um, historical position, performance during a time of crisis, uh, a kind of a store of value, no default risk and effective portfolio diversifier. These are all labels that are very commonly associated with gold and for very good reason. And it's something that, that central banks actually uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, agree with. and. and in fact, if you look back over the last five years of these surveys, you'll see that those factors always feature very heavily at the top um, in terms of the factors that are, are relevant for the decision to hold gold. And I think if you look more recently at the current state of the macroeconomic and the geopolitical environment, it probably comes as little surprise that central banks have, have earmarked these as, as key reasons why 
um, holding gold as part of their reserve portfolio um, is, is so important. Um, and again, I think what this kind of really highlights is that, you know, with, with the state of the state of the world at the moment, I think it's likely that these, these factors are going to remain relevant for some time yet, which kind of may, may point towards um, central banks continuing to have that, that favourable predisposition towards gold and that, that kind of favourable view to, to having it as a key part of their reserve portfolio. And what are central banks telling you about their intentions? I mean, what are they... What are you hearing in the survey about what they're looking at doing now? Yeah, so if, if we flip to the next slide, we'll actually see um, one of the other questions that we put in the survey actually is in respect to their intentions towards gold ownership and, and, and whether that's going to change. And we can see here that about 25% of respondents in 2022 indicated that they're going to increase their gold reserves over the next 12 months. And that's actually an increase over last year. And in fact, we've even seen that increase every single year that we've run, run the survey. Now, an interesting detail of that most recent uh, survey response, that 25% is wholly accounted for by emerging market central banks. So that is all um, that is uh, all, all the banks that, that responded positively to this, that they will increase reserves are emerging markets. And that links back to, to my point on the first slide is that actually emerging markets are a predominant driver of the central bank demand that we have seen um, over the last decade. Um, some of that will be down to the fact that their gold reserves are as a percentage of overall reserves is a much smaller proportion than Western central banks. Some of that down to a carryover from the gold standard and the Bretton Woods, they just happen to, to have a large proportion of gold. But I think what this talks to really is that, again, if we're now looking towards an outlook and what we see for the second half of 2022 and maybe thereafter is that the environment is still um, there for central banks uh, to hold gold um, and also their intentions that through the survey results seem to support that they they continue to see relevance for gold as a reserve asset and an interest in, in increasing increasing that um, whether that's by you know increasing their reserves or whether that's um, by by you know in getting a, a fresh exposure to gold that they may not have had previously so that supports our in-house um, expectation for central bank demand, at least for 2022, is that the full year we're going to see central banks remain net purchases. Uh, we don't have a firm forecast. We don't do that. But certainly in terms of an expectation, we do, we do expect central banks as a whole to increase the level of global gold reserves, uh, official gold reserves, that is, um, in 2022. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris. I mean, obviously, perhaps if we bring in Philip now, um, to have a look at silver, because one big difference, Krish, between gold and silver, of course, is that silver doesn't have central bank demand. Uh, obviously, silver used to be a monetary metal. Uh, some people still feel that it is. But, you know, gold's role within the global financial system is still pretty much assured, whereas for silver, that 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 section of demand simply isn't there. Um, Philip Newman, Managing Director, Metals Focus. Um, joins us today to have a look at what's going under the hood, what's going on under the hood in silver, because whilst gold did very well in comparative terms against other financial assets in the first half, obviously silver down, uh, what, 10% year to date, I think, Philip, 13? Yes, yes, hello, Adrian, hello everyone. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, it's around there, yes. And I think, I think you make a really good point, and that's what I was trying to do, or address on these few slides, this, you know, this, this disparity between how silver is behaving, say, in the physical markets on the one hand, and then, as you rightly pointed out, the, the price performance on, on the other. Um, and I know that when we presented for the, the Silver Institute just a few months ago, we launched a silver survey, there's, I think people were scratching their heads that these, these slides that we were showing and talking about the upside and the strength of silver demand, and well, then you, our- You've got record demand there. You've got 2022 as record demand. Well, we have, yes. And you sort of set that against our outlook for prices, which was a little less, maybe less bullish. So, but you're absolutely right. So on this first one, we're looking at uh, global civil demand. Um, and you know, not only is it a record high, but I think the other key takeaway is that, you know, it's comfortably, even last year, you know, it comfortably eclipsed what we saw in terms of pre-pandemic back, you know, past 2019 levels. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the first, the industrial segment, so it's about half or half of uh, silver demand that has been hitting new highs, doing exceptionally well across a range of, of segments, the likes of 
the, the solar or the photovoltaic market has been one that's been sort of leading the charge. Um, and that's in spite of this ongoing trend that we always speak about in terms of the, the thrifting and substitution that you see. Um, and the other one I think has been doing also very well is the one near the top, the, the physical investment, which for Metals Focus is a coin and bar demand. So this and, whole chart, Philip, sorry, all of this chart yes. is fabricated demand, right? This is fabricated products. So there's no exchange traded funds in here. There's no COMEX stockpiles or anything else. This is literal end user demand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is we're looking at sort of the, the transformation of silver. Um, you, you obviously have producer de-hedging or hedging there as well. Yeah. But yes, by and large, it's looking at the way silver is transformed. You're absolutely right. So it doesn't certainly include what's happening in ETF or the changing stocks, be it LBMA, COMEX, or, or in the, uh, China as well. Um, so, yeah, if you look at the, the coin and bar, just the strength of that, uh, led by just a few markets, it's really concentrated in terms of the, the main protagonists. So you've got the US, you have Germany, uh, India, and Australia. Those will be the main sort of heavyweights in that category. Um, so Australia is... I mean, Australia, obviously, as a as a nation, is what twenty million people. So it's, I mean, there's it's quite heavy to to actually figure as a as a as a big source of retail investment demand. Is that relatively new for Australia to actually show in in your numbers as you know, like top five? It is. You're absolutely right. I think it only really popped up in the last two or three years. Uh, before that, it was exceptionally modest. But you've seen very strong demand. I, I believe it's you know heavily going into sort of individual pension funds. Has been, I think, a very big area for that, um, and it's certainly joined the other three. Whereas India, um, Germany, in the US, they've always been sort of the, the top table, really. Okay, okay, thanks. So drilling down into the numbers a little bit, um, perhaps we move on to your next slide. What? Sure. So when we're th thinking about the strength of the US market, and so what we're looking at here is US bullion imports into the US over the, the past five years. And uh, this, so this is annual data. Some of these key trends have certainly carried on uh, this year. And I think the, the first thing to really uh, note is that the bullion coming in could be used for anywhere. So it could be going into powder demand, into the silver oxide market. But what we wanted to really capture here, we'll talk about is um, the, the upside that we're seeing again in the coin and bar sector. And so a couple of really, important trends here. Firstly, uh, you have Switzerland, you can see that on the right hand side. So whereas the where that really popped up in 2020, that was concentrated or you know, because of the EFP, the uh, exchange for physical crisis that we saw, whereas last year, that was heavily not entirely, but heavily concentrated with um, minted silver products going into the US from Switzerland. And we haven't really seen that before. Um, the other interesting one, you can see it just sort of popping up on 2021, one from the top is Turkey. And again, haven't seen that before. Um, and our contacts in Turkey tell us again, that was this um, attracting these coins, this sort of minted bar products into the States. Such was the strength of the US market as well. Um, where we saw these eye-watering premiums, these retail premiums. And in fact, those premiums have really carried on into this year. And it's only been the past month or so that those premiums have, have backed off. They're still pretty strong by historical standards, but they're just not at those eye-watering levels that we had you know, in, in the first half of this year. Which retail investors were happy to pay, though, right? Because demand didn't back off. even as Absolutely. Young. I mean, that was really the, you know, the, the, the premiums were for a one ounce coin, they were getting up to, you know, 30, you know, north of 30 percent, sometimes 40 percent. Really, you know, quite staggering. But Adrian, you're absolutely right. These weren't spikes. You know, these were consistent premiums. Um, there wasn't really a shortage of silver, to be clear. There was a shortage of investment products. But right. if you're a retail investor and you hear the word shortage, it, it sort of becomes a self-perpetuating. Oh, so, so the premium, the premium sells itself. Yes, yes. Right. And, and quite often, you know, investors, they weren't so much buying silver for the price upside, they were perhaps buying it for the premium upside as well. Right. So 
you know, interesting dynamics. And, and frankly, the gold market in the US was also going great guns as well. It certainly wasn't just a, a silver story um, by any means. Um, but you had this, this is what the interesting thing, you've had this tight market in, in the US for three nines, four nines premiums. Um, you had uh, a tight market, local New York versus local London, that's been tight for some time, eased off recently, but it's also unheard of to have that, that tightness for such a, a long period of time. And, and the fact that you had these unusual flows from Switzerland and Turkey into the US, that was obviously taking silver out of Europe that wouldn't have otherwise have happened. So you had that tightness as well. And that's why it was just unusual when you put all these, these um, well, I keep repeating the word, this, this tight market, and yet the price was doing what it was doing in so many words. And so if we bring that together and sort of jump to the, the next slide. So this is really, I guess, a 30,000 foot slide where we're looking at the, you know, the overall surplus, you know, new supply versus new demand. So again, this is not taking into account to Adrian's earlier point, what's happening in the, in the ETF space. Really important, I think, to get that across. Um, but again, you can see that we've moved from this period of overall of these surpluses. Yes, there were a couple of deficits and a couple of early years, but they were pretty modest. And now we believe that we're entering quite a new phase in the market going forward. Um, so that's, that should you know, provide you know, some, some you know, change of dynamics in the, in the marketplace. Um, but if you jump to the next one, then you will see that um, we're looking at the gold silver ratio. The left hand side is just a short term, and we've taken that back, you know, over you know a few more decades for the longer term. So this is where we simply take the gold price, we divide it by the silver price, and you effectively get a price for gold in silver, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you can see. Um, that the ratio on the far right hand side, so of the left chart, but you go get to the nearer dates, how that's creeping up into the, the early 90s or thereabouts. So, you know, we have this dynamic playing out. And if we, if we leave aside that spike you've got in early 2020, which was COVID, see, right? So that's when silver absolutely dumped. Silver was down at what, $9 at one point, I think. It was, it was, it was a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a bloodbath, for want of yeah. a better phrase, really. Yeah. You know, that's when institutional investors were really selling heavily. I think they were disappointed by how poorly silver was reacting to, to COVID. As well, well as and, it was the panic and it was the panic phase of the crisis as well, wasn't it? It was when every, yes. everyone was selling everything, right? They I mean, were. Everything. And what you tend to find that because silver is such a volatile market and so much smaller in liquidity compared to gold, that traditionally, and I say traditionally, that normally, you know, when gold's doing well, silver will outperform when gold's struggling silver will underperform that's the normal one but yeah. what you saw if you think about the past few months you know when when you know the invasion of ukraine started and how well gold did silver you know struggled and i think that you know has been perpetuated through now and i think the comment you made at the, the very beginning adrian about um you know the recession and where that's heading or concerns about that Silver, is, in a sense, has got that double whammy effect. You know, it's been hit as a precious metal because of the expectations of, of um, US rates in particular. And then it's also been hit as an industrial metal with those concerns about um, a recession as well. Hence why you can see that, that ratio sort of ticking up. And yeah. then if we jump to the next one, then I, I think... This, I think, for us sort of squares that circle. Why, on the one hand, we do have, you know, a pretty positive outlook for industrial demand overall. There are weak spots, no doubt about it, but overall, positive. And then you look at it on the other side where institutional investors, and here we're capturing um, net managed money positions on, on COMEX, um, or on the CME rather. And so you can see that on the right-hand side, how they've gone net short. Now, you know, we, we don't want to get carried away. You know, we're looking at a few weeks data. And so I think it's important not to necessarily extrapolate because of that entirely, but I think it is still be mindful. And although you can just about see that net short in about late May, the, the net short we're looking at now, that's the highest we've seen since mid 2019. 
And that was a time when silver was in its teens. Now, we're certainly not calling for silver to go back to that level. But I think it's interesting to see that, you know, when we look at the weakness in silver prices, I think this is one of those key areas that is responsible for that. Okay, I mean, it, it's a perennial question in precious metals, but I think particularly in silver, when we look at look at your data like this you know is the tail wagging the dog here you know physical fabricated product demand is records high um there's tightness across the market in physical certainly you know we're hearing that you know london is has been awash with silver over the last couple of years but that's no longer true you know silver mm -hmm. is getting a little you know just a, that little bit tighter in london as well yeah. certainly across the certainly across north america we're hearing that certainly in fabricated product and yet we're seeing the price come down. So it would look as if, you know, the CME uh, speculative position here is actually what is mapping the price, at least, in opposition to what's happening in the physical market, right? It, it will do to a, to a degree. But I, I think where we are looking at, I guess, going forward, and as those deficits become established and are quite sizable, we think that will help, in a sense, provide that floor. So I don't think those deficits necessarily will generate upside, price upside. But I think from a floor point of view, that is quite pivotal. And I think we shouldn't underestimate how important that is. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Taylor, if we want to move on to the next slide, as I say, this question of, you know, do deficit, uh, sorry, do derivatives, you know, move price more than they should? Or, you know, is there something going on here? A couple of people have asked me about this slide, this chart here over the last couple of weeks. Um, this comes from the U.S. Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which is a division of the U.S. Treasury. It's basically a banking regulator in the U.S. And this chart shows you the notional amount of precious metals derivatives um, being held by U.S. banks, those who are regulated by the OCC. And you can see that I think it's Q4 data, so the last calendar quarter of each year, all the way until you get to Q1. 2022, which is over on the far right hand side, and you can see this phenomenal jump. And at first glance, this looks remarkable. It looks as if, you know, precious metals derivatives have suddenly ballooned. And you've gone from, if you look at the axis on the left, you've got uh, about 100 billion uh, US dollars worth suddenly jumping to the best part of 500 billion. Uh, and as I say, a lot of people have looked at this and said, oh my Lord, you know, there's this huge ballooning of banks in the US holding precious metals derivatives. However, if we just click onto the next slide, Taylor, um, there's a note beneath this slide and it says this, it basically says that there's been a change in the way that the data is collated and recorded. And prior to January 1st, gold was not included in the way the OCC counted precious metals derivatives. That might sound crazy, but an awful lot of banks count gold as a foreign currency. They trade it off their FX desk. They see it as a currency. Central banks certainly see it as a monetary asset. And so precious metals derivatives haven't included on the OCC's data until Jan 1st this year, haven't included gold, which of course is the elephant in that space. So if we compare this with, on the next slide, the FX market, so there's our slide there on the left, our chart, which shows you this huge ballooning of precious metals derivatives because gold has come in to that bucket from the FX market. If you look at the foreign exchange chart there, um, if you look at the axis on that, you can see it is many, many times bigger than precious metals. So as of Q1 2022, precious metals derivatives, notionally, the notional value being held by US banks is about 500 billion. 40 trillion in FX. So gold was only a very small portion of the FX market, and now it's been moved into what has traditionally been a much smaller pot for accounting. The BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, they count uh, more globally. You know, these two are not fungible. You can't compare the data directly and say, well, that's US banks and this is global. Um, but nonetheless, you can actually see that certainly they've only got their data so far going up until uh, December 31st. But you can see that the second half of 2021 was actually down on the first half of 2021 for notional quantities of global gold derivatives and precious metals more broadly. So this, if we move on to the next slide, Taylor, is an outcome actually of 
something which uh, myself and David Gornell, senior advisor to the LBMA, have returned to a couple of times over the last couple of years, which is what's happening in banking regulations and how that impacts particularly bullion trading um, and what's happening there. And David, I think this would be an example, right? What the OCC have done here in moving gold from FX into precious metals is an, ex that's an outcome of, of changing regulations under, under Basel, right? Yeah, and it's very, <clears throat> it's very similar to uh, the subjects we've spoken to in the past, um, where there is some confusion when we talk about gold and Basel III. So amongst the 1,626 pages, um, it's easy to get confused because often Basel refers to gold uh, uh, as a currency or viewed as a currency, I wouldn't say referred to, but views it as a currency. And in other rules, uh, such as the one that you've just highlighted, which is the, the new standardized approach to counterparty credit risk, uh, and NSFR, gold is looked upon as a commodity. And the other confusion that we've, that we've talked about here before is the, is the confusion on the weightings, whereas uh, tier one capital permits the inclusion of gold uh, as zero weighted, as do claims secured by gold. But when we talk about the stable funding rules, uh, it's a commodity and it requires 85% stable funding. So I think that's, you know, that, that, that highlights the difficulty that we all face in trying to understand the rules and then the implementation of these rules when they change and, and, we, and we get this, this big hit. So this is literally down to how Basel impacts the categorization of stuff and, and I guess how banks have to account for things. They have to hold extra capital against... I mean, are you saying that banks have to hold extra capital against gold in one, in one regard but not in another? Well, it's not. Yes, it's not weighted. So they're permitted to use all of it. Right. In, in So one is a haircut and one is a funding requirement. And that's another thing that people get mixed up. Yeah. So if, if you've got 100 ounces of gold in your tier one capital, you can all use all 100. Um, th there's yet another uh, definition as well, which if you're using this uh, as a collateral at a clearinghouse, you can only use 80 of the ounces. But when you're funding it, you're you're required um, to provide 85% stable funding, which is funding that lasts for a, a one year time horizon. Right, okay. And how does this tie in with, again, something which we've, we've touched upon before uh, in LBMA webinars, but there has been some chatter as well around gold being viewed as a high quality liquid asset, which is basically the gold standard for one of a, of a less hokey phrase for this. But I mean, HQLA is the stuff that banks need to set against all their other positions, right? I mean, this is, you know, the, the real stuff, right? And so in terms of HQLA, I mean, what's been going on in that market and what's been going on in that space so far this year? So, yes, yeah, so we've, we've been talking about net stable funding ratio on, on these debates before, haven't we? And that's largely gone quiet uh, because of um, the, the effect that the carve out in the UK by the UK regulatory authorities has allowed the clearers to do. So it hasn't had, uh, uh, a negative impact on, on the clearing. And the um, carve-out, sorry Dave, just the carve-out on that was what? So this was the interdependent assets and liabilities. So that the physical gold that a bank would hold for a client was matched by the, the asset and liability are, are interdependent. And so, so, if I've, so if I'm a bank and I've got gold and I've got a client who holds a gold exposure, I can offset that and say, well, actually, I, you know, this risk is offset by that. Yes. So, so previous to this clarification, uh, what, what, what a lot of um, uh, providers were, were looking at was having to, to, to put funding aside in a high quality liquid asset. I mean, what do we mean by that? That's cash or government bonds, the tier one assets uh, against that gold. Whereas now, if they can demonstrate that one is linked to the other in what Basel refers to as an interdependent asset and liability, uh, then it is acceptable uh, to to wash one against the other, so to speak, and you, you don't have to provide that funding. So that 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 relieves the burden from that perspective. But I think what what's changed recently is um, is is the debate about HQLA. So it's no secret that you know within these wars um, that the LBMA believes that gold can demonstrate it can conform to the criteria of HQLA as laid down by the Basel Committee. And, and therefore it should eventually be included uh, within that list, uh, for perhaps in Basel IV. Um, but what we don't really know yet is <clears throat> how that, that claim will be received in, in Basel. 
And I think some jurisdictions are more favourable than others. Um, we've seen in Basel III implementations that local supervisors can take local decisions due to nuanced markets. So for example, the EU introduced a separate stable funding factor for covered bonds. Okay. So, 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 so you, can, you, you can introduce them uh, at a local level, but broadly speaking, if you speak to a central bank, they'll say we're, we're guided by uh, Basel and introducing gold uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be as straightforward as increasing the list of equities. Because okay, but is that where there's movement? Because obviously with HQLA, the more that Basel, well, I know it's been implemented, but the more that it actually takes effect, I presume people need more and more HQLA to grow their business effectively, right? Well, they, they certainly do. And I, and I think that one thing that we've noticed this year is that, you know, is this a paradigm shift in the markets, what we've seen uh, in, in the bond markets in particular, and the shrinkage of... Um, uh, of, the, of the of the US uh, central bank's balance sheet has has affected liquidity in a number of ways, and I know in the US uh, they they have a nuanced liquidity ratio, called the supplementary liquidity ratio that limits the total balance sheet, and and there is a there is a lot of people there concerned about the the effect that this is having um, on on markets in general in in terms of liquidity. That's one example. The other example that we've noticed. Um, a bit like here in the UK, that the Australian regulator conducted um, a, a consultation recently uh, on, on LCR and uh, NSFR. And it's proposing now that cover bonds are introduced uh, as, as an HQLA and that the equity range is extended down to the ASX 200 into that liquidity pool. So, so why, why are they doing this now? And, and I think you, you could probably see that this, this nuance work works on both sides of the balance sheet. If you're looking at, at Australia, where there's not a lot of government bonds flying around, uh, it's, it's not really uh, as liquid locally. So instead, the RBA had to create a proxy for debt and they created a committed liquidity facility. Therefore, for some jurisdictions, gold would be a clear alternative to, to actions such as the RBAs. Okay. Very, very interesting. I mean, I know it's something which LBMA, World Gold Council have been looking at for, you know, for many years now about how gold is recognised as a high quality liquid asset, um, which I think those of us in the market would recognise that it really is, you know, deeply liquid. Um, so that's very, very useful, very interesting update. Thank you, David. Um, just going to questions. Thank you very much. I'm just, where are the questions? I'm looking for Q&A, Taylor. Oh, there we are. Thank you. Um, OK, that's an interesting one. One for you, Philip, I think, if we may. Um, regarding the gold-silver ratio, has the gold-silver ratio, is it a useful guide to opportunities in gold or silver? I mean, does it show us opportunities when gold or silver are relatively cheap? I mean, it can do, possibly. I always, though, I'm very mindful that, for example, you know, when, say, the gold silver ratio, take, for example, now, you know, approaching 90 or around 90, you know, the long term average depends how far go you, back you go will be perhaps somewhere in the, the mid to high 60s. But that doesn't necessarily mean, therefore, that we should revert back to that or that silver will, will do so. You know, there are underlying reasons why silver is performing you know, relatively weak versus gold. And I think we have to un understand those reasons before we can think about, well, you know, it is offering that value. Obviously, some people do trade that, and the prices we see now will encourage investors in, be it the US or, or India, for example. We know that India traditionally, you know, does have a strong price expectations. But I wouldn't look at it in isolation and say, okay, that data point suggests it should do X, Y, Z afterwards. Okay, unless it's March 2020 and the ratio has gone to 130. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> then you could get your heart, potentially. Not that I'm offering investment advice. No, heaven forbid. No, 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 no. No investment advice here today. Um, Chris, one for you, if we can. Um, uh, maybe a little bit hot for WGC, I know, but is there a political angle, do you think, to European Union members such as Ireland, Poland, Hungary buying gold? Uh, you know, is this a reserves decision? Do you think there's any element of politicking on those kind of decisions? Yeah, I, I think there's more. There's 
it's more likely that this is more a investment decision uh, at a strategic level. I think it's it's more likely that they are looking to potentially use it to diversify their reserves for many of the factors that we mentioned, the fact that it you know possesses no default risk uh, or counterparty risk. Uh, certainly it's, it's a, a very useful diversifier. It, it's a means of, of, of kind of storing wealth um, and, and potentially can even help generate returns in the long run. So um, I, I certainly think it's more likely. It, it, there, are, there have been pockets. So for example, in Central and Eastern Europe, where we have not only seen more buying and, and some small selling, but we've also shown uh, or seen comments from central banks and central bankers um, and politicians indicating that they would like to increase their reserves further. So even in June, um, we saw uh, the incoming head of the Czech central bank indicate that he would like to increase their gold reserves. But much of the reasons uh, that he was given or that was reported were, were uh, investment related. They were more, more portfolio uh, driven rather than they were um, to do with geopolitics. Um, however, it's quite possible that the geopolitical situation, not necessarily just in Europe, but globally, um, is also you know, a, a factor somewhere in the mix uh, for the, any, any potential investment decision because central banks operate on such long kind of investment horizons. Um, it's reasonable to, to believe that, that, you know, geopolitics will come in somewhere, but I don't think that the recent activity that we've seen um, is, is being driven, you know, primarily by, by politics. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, right, we've got a couple more questions, but I'm afraid that really looking for investment advice, and, and that's really not what we're able to do today. Um, okay, just... One final one, David, if I may, um, a question that I had for you, something we touched upon when we were just preparing this webinar, in terms of, you mentioned that there's been some chatter now around regulators looking at stable coins, obviously crypto, uh, the crypto crash of the last six months, uh, from what, three trillion in value down to one trillion in terms of unbacked coin. But in terms of stable coins, you were saying that you think there might be some uh, moves regarding regulation of stable coins and that potentially could have a backwash into physical commodities. Now, this was um, the last couple of days. I, I noticed that um, CPMI IOSCO uh, had, had issued um, some, some guidance uh, and it, it refers to the need for uh, systemically important stable coins, which could include gold and currencies to conform with the, the Basel principles for uh, payment market infrastructure. So, I mean, just had a quick look at it. It's only 15 pages or so, um, but it, it focuses on governance, risk management, settlement finality and, and money settlements. So we'll have to see what, what comes out of that. They, they haven't left any holes or rabbit holes that we can climb down and dig around in yet. Um, I'm sure they, they, they'll, they'll be um, coming out soon. Okay, that's very interesting. Well, thank you very much, guys. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope that's been useful. Um, Thank you for the questions that have come in as well. And uh, Taylor, have a good summer, everybody. Taylor, back to you. Thanks, Adrian. And thank you to our panelists, Krishan, David, Bill, and of course, Adrian. Um, if you did have any questions that you did submit today and we didn't have time to answer them or couldn't answer them, uh, we will forward them across to the panelists. Um, if you do have any questions uh, that come to you after the webinar or you are watching this as a recorded version, do send them through to ask at lbma.org.uk. Um, there is also a survey at the end of this, so if you do have any um, suggestions um, or questions, you can drop those into that. Um, Following that, um, as Adrian says, it is our last webinar for the summer. We are planning to return in September. Um, but just to run you through um, the upcoming events that we do have, we do have uh, a local London training. So on the 26th and 27th of September, uh, we have a different time zone, uh, so 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. BST across both days. So you can learn a little bit more about the local London market, uh, prices, good delivery, et cetera. We'll also be running that in person on the 29th um, and then again on the 17th and the one on the 17th will be followed by our how to use local London uh, the day after which we'll look a little bit more into depth um, on specific topics within the first course. Um, 
as, as always um, promoted in these webinars, we do have our Global Precious Metals Conference um, in conjunction with LPPM, uh, and that will take place from the 16th to the 18th of October. I just came back from an inspection trip. It looks excellent. We have wonderful plans for you if you are hoping to attend. We hope that we are able to see you uh, after, especially after such a long time away. Um, so do let us know if you have any questions about those events. We're more than happy to assist you uh, with any of your queries. Um, and with that, a uh, final thank you to our panellists and to our attendees. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, and have uh, a very lovely weekend ahead. <laughs>